I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. President John F. Kennedy's speech on May 25th, 1961 was a call to the nation to send an American astronaut to the moon by the end of the decade. In this speech, he was essentially responding to a set of Soviet successes in space beginning with Sputnik and culminating with the launch of Yuri Gagarin in 1961. But this was also essentially framed in, in, a, in a larger geopolitical si situation in which Kennedy was seeking to reassert American confidence and superiority in the larger global stage. I'm Asa Siddiqui. I'm a professor at Fordham University and I specialize in the history of science and technology. I'm a member of the National Research Council's Committee on Human Space Flight. There was a perception in the late 50s and early 60s that America had essentially fallen behind in science and technology and um, all the Soviet successes in space had essentially um, chipped into that kind of self-confidence that America had in the 50s. One of the most vocal proponents of a strong space program was Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson who had argued that the nation that controlled space controlled the globe, echoing the British Empire's domination of the seas. So it was really a geopolitical response. It wasn't at the time really thought in terms of science. Yeah, Kennedy's speech was a big anomaly in terms of the early history of NASA. If you look at the history of NASA, which was established in 1958, there's kind of a measured um, slow progress, slow expansion uh, in terms of new centers and things like that. But Kennedy's speech was really punctuated that history and said, we're not going to just, you know, do a bunch of little things. We're going to do this big thing. There was an important transition around, let's say, roughly 1970, uh, where you have kind of Apollo winding down and a new President Nixon beginning to grapple with how to really proceed in space. The President appointed a space task group to determine what were the options, and they came up with some ideas such as uh, a Mars mission, a uh, space station, and a space shuttle. Space had essentially become, by the early 70s, one of a set of things the nation was willing to invest in. It was no longer an extremely important, urgent national goal like it was in the 60s. But there was a concern that the next follow-on space, human spaceflight system, should not be too expensive. And the shuttle's reusability, or at least its partial reusability, was a great asset in terms of selling it as a follow-on program. So eventually what survived was the space shuttle which was eventually announced in early 1972 by President Nixon as the next follow-on program beyond Apollo. The notion that space expenditures must take their place in a rigorous national system of priorities has essentially guided the human spaceflight policy of all presidential administrations since the early 1970s. And in particular, economic, scientific, and military rationales have essentially guided those decisions. The National Academy's Committee on Human Spaceflight is reevaluating the current rationales for human spaceflight and using those as a jumping off point to explore possible strategic directions for the human spaceflight program of NASA, particularly beyond low Earth orbit.